Welcome to Natu Reads, an audio library of revolutionary texts. Interview with Chairman Gonzalo. Conducted by El Diario. Part 4. Four. On the national political situation. El Diario. Chairman, what is the PCP's analysis of the Peruvian state and where it is headed? Chairman Gonzalo. We have an understanding of the workings of contemporary Peruvian society, by which we mean the society which came into being in 1895. We believe that the process we are living through began then, and that there have been three stages. The first stage laid the basis for the development of bureaucrat capitalism. The second stage, which deepened the development of bureaucrat capitalism, began after World War II, because the first stage lasted until then. This deeper development of bureaucrat capitalism ripened the conditions for revolution. With the beginning of the People's War in 1980, we entered the third stage, the general crisis of bureaucrat capitalism. The destruction of contemporary Peruvian society has begun, because it has become historically outmoded. Therefore, what we are witnessing is its end, and the only correct course is to battle, to fight, and to struggle to bury it. El Diario Why do you consider the thesis of bureaucrat capitalism to be fundamental? Chairman Gonzalo. We consider this thesis of Chairman Mao Zedong to be key, because without understanding it and wielding it, it is not possible to carry out a democratic revolution, much less conceive of its interrupted continuation into the socialist revolution. It is really very wrong for this thesis of Chairman Mao's to be disregarded. Plainly, they jumble his analysis all up by talking to us about the development of capitalism in backward countries or dependent capitalism, which leads to nothing but changing the character of the revolution. We believe that it is by taking Chairman Mao as our starting point that we are going to really understand Peruvian society and those societies they call backward. We understand that bureaucrat capitalism began to emerge in Peru in 1895 through the three stages that I previously outlined. We conceive of it this way. Capitalism developed on top of a semi-feudal base, and under imperialist domination. It is a capitalism born late, tied to feudalism, and subordinated to imperialist domination. These are the conditions that produce what Chairman Mao Zedong has called bureaucrat capitalism. So, bureaucrat capitalism develops bound to big monopoly capital, which controls the economy of the country. This capital is made up, as Chairman Mao said, of the big capital of the large landowners, the comprador bourgeoisie, and the big bankers. Thus, bureaucrat capitalism emerges bound, I repeat, to feudalism, subordinated to imperialism, and it is monopolistic. We must keep this in mind, it is monopolistic. At a certain point in its development, this capitalism is combined with state power and uses the economic means of the state, uses the state as an economic lever, and this process gives rise to another faction of the big bourgeoisie, the bureaucrat bourgeoisie. This gives rise to a further development of bureaucrat capitalism, which was already monopolistic and becomes, in turn, state-owned. But this whole process gives rise to conditions which ripen the revolution. This is another important concept, politically speaking, that the chairman laid out about bureaucrat capitalism. If we understand bureaucrat capitalism, we can understand very well how Peru has semi-feudal conditions, bureaucrat capitalism, and imperialist, mainly Yankee, domination. This is what we must understand, and what allows us to understand and lead the democratic revolution. Now, what other importance does bureaucrat capitalism have? The chairman says that the democratic revolution realizes some socialist advances which, he says, were already expressing themselves, 
for example, in the mutual aid teams in the base areas of the countryside, in China. To move from the democratic to the socialist revolution, it is key, from an economic point of view, to confiscate all bureaucrat capital, which will permit the new state to control the economy, to direct it, and, in this way, serve the development of the socialist revolution. We understand that this strategic concept is of great importance, and, I reiterate, it is unfortunately being disregarded, and as long as it is disregarded, it will not be possible to correctly understand what a democratic revolution is under the present circumstances in which we struggle. It is erroneous to think that bureaucrat capitalism is the capitalism that the state develops with the economic means of production that it directly controls. This is erroneous, and it does not conform to Chairman Mao's thesis. Just think of it like this. If bureaucrat capital were only state-owned capitalism, and you confiscated this state-owned capital, in whose hands would the other, non-state-owned monopoly capital remain? In the hands of reaction of the big bourgeoisie. This view, which identifies bureaucrat capitalism with state monopoly capitalism, is a revisionist concept, and in our party it was upheld by the left liquidationists. Hence, we understand this problem to be a very important one. Furthermore, politically, it allows us to differentiate very clearly between the big bourgeoisie and the national or middle bourgeoisie, and this gives us the means to understand so that we don't pin ourselves to the tail of any faction of the big bourgeoisie, either the comprador or bureaucrat bourgeoisies, which is what revisionism and opportunism have done and continue to do in Peru. There have been decades of this perverse policy of labeling one faction of the big bourgeoisie the national bourgeoisie, hence progressive, and supporting them. Grasping bureaucrat capitalism permitted us to more clearly understand the differentiation, I repeat, between the national bourgeoisie and the big bourgeoisie, and grasp the correct tactics to carry out, taking up again precisely what Mariátegui has established. For this reason, we consider the thesis on bureaucrat capitalism to be of utmost importance. El Diario How would you sum up your political and economic analysis of the present conjuncture and its prospects? Is this situation perhaps favorable for the PCP? What does it pose for reaction, revisionism, and opportunism? Chairman Gonzalo We believe that bureaucrat capitalism has entered into a general crisis. Moreover, we believe that this bureaucrat capitalism was born sick because it derived from semi-feudalism or is tied to it and from imperialism. Semi-feudalism is obviously outmoded, and imperialism is moribund. What kind of child could come from these two parents condemned to death by incurable disease? A sick, stunted monster that has entered its phase of destruction. We think that the crises will become sharper and sharper, that, even as some economists say, there have been more or less 30 years of crisis from which we have not emerged, except for some small ripples of recovery. Or, as Abra says in its own internal documents, this is a crisis that has existed since the middle of the 70s. We can see that each new crisis is worse than the previous one. And, if we add to this the two critical decades of the 80s and 90s, back to back, the situation becomes clear. What do they themselves say? That this government will leave behind an extremely grave situation, and that those who follow supposing that others do follow through their electoral renovation, will have to seek some way out to overcome the problems left behind, and, consequently, not until 1995 can they even think about any kind of development. And this is being said in a country which is already 20 years behind. Because of all this, we think the prospects for them are extremely bleak. Is this favorable for the revolution, for the people's war, for the party? Yes, it is. First and foremost, for our class and the people, because all our work is for them, so that our class can rule, lead, so that the people can exercise their freedom and satisfy their centuries-old hunger. We see no prospects whatever for revisionism and reaction. We believe that they are united. They are like Siamese twins, and they will march together to the grave. This is what we think. El Diario 
Why do you characterize the Apra government as fascist and corporatist? What do you base this on? What is your opinion of Alan Garcia Perez's speech at the Apra Youth Congress in Ayacucho and the one he gave in Paita? What is your opinion of the economic measures of the new cabinet? Chairman Gonzalo. Concerning the characterization of the Apra government, without looking at its historical aspect, which has other implications that we don't need to examine today, the concrete situation that Abra was faced with, when, by agreement, it was given leadership of the Peruvian state, was one full of dilemmas. There existed two tendencies within it. One was fascist, and the other was demo-liberal. This is what was going on in Abra, and we understand that in this case, the demo-liberal position meant the maintenance of the reactionary constitutional order established in 1920, in 1933, and in 1979. That's what we mean by the demo-liberal order. Opera had a problem. Its need for investments to be able to push forward the economy, or, more exactly, to showcase some successes. This is what they have done, use up what little they had in order to present us with a showcase of successes as fragile as glass. And we are seeing the proof of this today. So, there is no way you can say that Apra's plan was a good economic plan. Because if it was such a good plan, why are the results so bad? It doesn't make sense. So, Apra had to resort to using capital from the comprador bourgeoisie, and they, obviously, demanded certain conditions. In Apra's own documents, they say that by the end of 1985, the big bourgeoisie, particularly the comprador bourgeoisie, was already beginning to recover and cash in. The year 1986 was like paradise for them. They made billions of dollars in profits, as they themselves have said, thinking that later they would reinvest. But this plan was not going to work. The economy was bound to go into crisis and fail, and therefore they could not reinvest. Since then, the conflict between them has sharpened further, hence the struggles between the two factions of the big bourgeoisie. On the other hand, Opera, with regard to the people, was confronted with the immense, unsatisfied needs of the masses. Demagogically, as always, they made promises to everybody. Demagogically, because what Opera sought to do was simply to try to develop, to unfold the reactionary economic process which could not be carried out without restricting the income of the people, because where do profits come from? From surplus value. So they had a problem with the masses, and they knew it, Hence their repressive, anti-popular, anti-union, anti-worker policies. This could be seen from the beginning. But there were other circumstances, the People's War. Even though they did not want to, Opera had to confront the People's War, which was already a central problem. All these conditions are the ones that determined that changes had to take place inside Opera in order to resolve their dilemma. But when did they resolve it? The dilemma got resolved with the genocide of 1986. The class struggle of the masses, the people's war principally, and the genocidal actions pushed Opera to choose fascism and brought about the triumph of the fascist faction. We believe it was then that it happened, and so began what everyone now recognizes as the loss of prestige and a setback for Opera, not only in Peru, but in the whole world. Why do we call it fascist? The fascist faction that already existed in Opera took political measures to implement corporatization, although it was already contained in the first speech by Garcia Perez in July 1985. What do we understand by fascist and corporatist? For us, fascism is the negation of liberal democratic principles, the negation of the bourgeois democratic principles which were born and developed in the 18th century in France. These principles are being abandoned by reactionaries, by the bourgeoisie worldwide. So it was that the First World War made us see the crisis of the bourgeois democratic order. That's why later fascism emerged. So, in Opera, what is going on is this negation of the principles of the bourgeois democratic order, and we see daily proof of the negation of all the constitutionally established rights and liberties. We see fascism also on an ideological plane as an eclectic system without a defined philosophy. It is a philosophical position made up of fragments chosen from here and there according to what's most useful. 
This is clearly expressed in Garcia Perez. When he goes to Harare in Africa, he's an African, and he salutes the Africans, salutes Kenneth Kaunda. When he goes to India, he salutes Gandhi, he's a Gandhian. When he goes to Mexico, he hails Zapata, he's a Zapatista. When he goes to the Soviet Union, if he ever does, he'll be the champion of perestroika. He's like that because this is the ideological and philosophical training of fascism. It does not have a defined stand. It is eclectic, and it takes what is at hand. With regard to its corporatism, we understand corporatism as the setting up of the state based on corporations, which implies the negation of parliamentarism. This is an essential point that Mariantegui gave emphasis to in History of the World Crisis. He said that the crisis of bourgeois democracy expresses itself clearly in the crisis of parliamentarism. Looking at the parliament here, while it is true that in the last decades it has been the executive that has produced the most important laws in this country, it is during this opera government that the executive has monopolized the creation of all the fundamental laws for its own purposes. No important laws have come from the parliament. This is a fact and everything has been aimed at giving powers to the executive so that it can do and undo as it pleases. Everything is a negation of parliamentarism. The problem of corporatism in our country is not a recent one. Already in 1933, during the second restructuring of the Peruvian state in this century, when the constitution was being debated, Victor Victor Andres Belaunde put forward the corporatization of Peruvian society, Villaran, who was the chairman of the reporting committee of the Constitution, opposed it, stating, how are we going to corporatize if there are no corporations? It was a way of dodging the issue. There are precedents. Now that they are talking so much about Mr. Belaunde, whose works have just been published, it is fitting to remember his stand. In the face of liberalism, which focuses on money, and communism, which negates the individual, What we need are corporatist systems modeled after those of medieval times. It is good to keep this in mind in order to see corporatism's affiliation and its roots, and also keep very much in mind that it is intimately linked to the position set forth by the papacy starting in the past century. Velasco also tried to corporatize the country. That's why he started the formation of corporations of agricultural producers, for example. His own agrarian law, 17716, had the political aim of establishing corporatist basis. The industrial law did too. How? Through the industrial community. His famous political organization, which was never consolidated, also put forward positions which were clearly fascist and corporatist. But they didn't succeed in carrying out in Peru. And what are they trying to do? What do they want? They want the formation of corporations, that is, to organize the producers and all members of society along corporatist lines. Let's assume that the small factory producers, the agricultural producers, merchants, professionals, students, the church, the armed forces, and the police forces all name their delegates, and in this way form a corporative system. This is what they are seeking to do and what APRA is doing. And the regions and micro-regions, what is their significance? This whole plan for establishing regions today serves the corporatization of our country. That is why we have to oppose it openly. Not only because it represents political maneuvering by opera for electoral advantage, but because it is a corporatist system. And, furthermore, it is putting at risk a country which doesn't even have a consolidated national unity. These are extremely serious matters. For these reasons, we say it is a fascist and corporatist government. The road they are trying to promote explains their great preoccupation with the regions that they want to impose, no matter what it takes. This is what we are seeing, and hence all these extraordinary parliamentary assemblies which have failed to fulfill what Garcia has called for. Last year he stated, either the regions are formed, or I'll stop calling myself Alan Garcia Perez. A year has passed, and I don't know what he is calling himself today, because the regions have not been formed. Now they say by the end of this year. We'll see. With regard to identifying fascism with terror, with repression, we think that this is a mistake. What's involved is the following. 
If one remembers Marxism, the state is organized violence. That is the classic definition. All states use violence because they are dictatorships. How else would they assert themselves to oppress and exploit? They couldn't do it. Consequently, what happens is that fascism develops a broader, more refined, more sinister violence. But to identify fascism as being the same as violence is a crass error. These are ideas that have developed here in Peru since World War II, and they are ideas that Del Prado often promoted and spread. These same ideas were also put forward by Damer. Identifying fascism with terror means not understanding Mariantegui, who, in figures and aspects of world life, when talking of H.G. Wells, tells us that the bourgeois state goes through a process of development, and that it is this process that leads to a fascist and corporative system. This can be understood very well if we study Mariantegui's works, the previously mentioned history of the world crisis, or the contemporary scene. Let's not forget that he lived it, studied it, and came to know it directly. In this country, we have to look at fascism and its different aspects, beginning with its ideology, its politics, and its organizational form, how it uses violence, its terror. Today, we see how it practices a skillful violence, more developed, broader, more brutal and vicious. This is what is called terror. But apart from this, white terror has always been practiced, has it not? The reactionaries, when they have encountered difficulties, have always applied white terror. So we should never identify and reduce all fascism simply to terror. We must understand that fascism means a more refined violence, and the development of terrorism, yes, but that is not the totality of it, but a component. It is fascism's means of enfolding reactionary violence. As for Garcia Perez's speech at the Opera Youth Congress, in some, there is an intense struggle in opera, which has to do with their next Congress, and the problem consists in whether Garcia Perez will maintain his control over that party or not, while keeping himself in power in collusion with the armed forces. For some time, it's been apparent that the opera youth have questioned the work of the government, and this expressed itself in a big way at this Congress in Ayacucho. And Garcia Perez had to make a desperate trip in order to explain, to explain himself, and to present himself as the savior. This is what he wants, because he sees the importance of winning over the youth in the interest of his appetite to be Führer. I believe this gets to the essence of it. Concerning what he said about our party, and the supposed admiration he says he has for it, this simply reveals the struggle inside Apara, because someone who is a genocidal assassin, who daily murders the people, the fighters, the communists, can't have admiration for us. This is demagogical posturing, uncontrollable appetites linked to the Apara Congress and related to its political prospects, because he can still play many cards. The man is quite young. Concerning Paita, the Paita speech, essentially, it was a fascist speech, openly fascist. It was not, as some say, to give the parliamentarians who are raising a ruckus a slap on the wrist. That kind of thing is commonplace among them, and there is nothing extraordinary about it. But that was not what this was about. It was a strictly fascist speech. Garcia Perez wants to become Führer. There's a reason why they call him Conductor. Many times, Congressman Roca himself has called him conductor. Isn't conductor the same as Führer? It means the same thing in German. Therefore, I think it's correct when some call him the apprentice Führer. But in the end, what he is showing us is that he's just a cheap demagogue with a big, unrestrained appetite, ready to do anything to satisfy it. I think self-idolatry is one of his characteristics. As for the economic measures of the new cabinet, as was inevitable, no one agrees with them. Of course no one agrees with them, and the people least of all, which is what interests us. So a double contradiction emerges. The first one is with the comprador bourgeoisie, because the economic measures are insufficient. They ask the opera government for more measures, and they demand a definition of the plan, because this plan is for 18 months but consists only of a general outline, without dealing concretely with important problems. 
For its five years in office, Opera is going to proceed like this, from one emergency plan to another and yet another. From emergency to emergency, which amounts to the total unraveling of the plans it had thought to implement during its term. I am referring here to their own documents. And the second contradiction is inevitably with the people, whose belts are being tightened in the interest of generating new capital. How and from where can capital be obtained? By reducing salaries. These are, in sum, the measures, and that's why they have created more problems for Opera than they already had. Meanwhile, they continue, demagogically, postponing what the very order within which they operate imposes on them, and what they themselves bring on by being puppets, because they have long been in collusion with the United States, with imperialism. Their ties with the World Bank and the Inter-American Development Bank, BID, are extremely clear, and these are the instruments that the imperialists are using more now due to the discrediting of the IMF, although the prospects are that Opera will return to the fold of the IMF. So those economic measures are not resolving the situation, they are worsening it. And we are going to have an extremely grave and critical economic situation, which will develop even further, becoming a tremendous burden on the backs of the masses. El Diario Chairman, how do you see the upcoming elections shaping up, and the possibility of a coup or a coup backed by the government itself? Chairman Gonzalo If you'll allow me, I'd like to say that the main thing about the elections is the need to boycott them, and, if possible, prevent them. Why do we say this? What do the people have to gain? Nothing. The people won't gain anything through an electoral renewal. I think this can be seen very clearly in this country's history. In the document, Develop People's War to Serve the World Revolution, we pointed this out. We showed this to be the case, and no one has disproved it. We showed how the percentage of votes for the IU was what prevented the majority from expressing their opposition to the elections. I believe this has been shown. We have therefore put forward, and the facts have borne out, that the tendency in Peru is to expect nothing from elections or from a new government. The tendency is to reject elections. Where does the problem lie? In the way revisionism and opportunism continue promoting elections, that's where the problem lies. So what is the key point here? To strike blows and expose what the electoral process means, that it means nothing except allowing the renewal of the authorities of this old and rotting order, that it means nothing else. Because they won't be able to tell us that it means maintaining this democratic arena. This is an old story that no one is going to believe anymore. This is the story that those who today belong to the PUM told us at the time of the Constituent Assembly. And then, in 1980, they said that there was democratic space, that we were in a pre-revolutionary situation, and that by using the parliament as a tribune, we could go over to a revolutionary situation, only to tell us later that we had to focus on defending the existing order. I think that this is the main thing for the people, that the majority express their repudiation of the elections, even if by simply casting a blank vote, even if it is just by doing that. This is important, because it's how the will of the masses of the people, the immense majority, who already understand that the electoral road offers no solutions, will be expressed. I think that they have wanted to make use of the elections, putting forward the electoral campaign, in order to get the people to focus their attention on the elections. But we see that this plan has failed for two reasons. The first is the serious problems that the people have, and how their fighting spirit is growing daily, which the people's war serves to push forward. Secondly, the very contradictions that have thrown all the existing political institutions into great turmoil. The IU is a jumble of contradictions, so is the so-called Fredemo, and APRA is a pot brimming with party hacks. That's how it really is. And if their eager plans to divert the attention of the people have failed, and if those conditions are those of a people's war with great prospects, as is really the case, all revolutionaries who want to see this country transformed must push for the people to reject this process. 
let them figure out how to replace their authorities. It's their problem, not ours. That's how we see it. About a possible coup d'etat? Well, in this country, the possibility of a coup always exists. And we understand that the army itself is already alarmed, pointing out that they don't see any political force capable of confronting the people's war. If the army is saying that, then it means that a coup could occur at any moment. But it could occur in many different ways, and that's the other question. It could be something similar to what happened in Uruguay with Bordoberi, which could be Garcia Perez in this case. It could be a self-engineered coup. That's another card that Garcia Perez has up his sleeve, because a coup would remove him as a victim and not as a political failure that he is. And since he's young, some time later, he could come back as a martyr and defender of democracy. That's why this is another card this demagogic expert in sleight of hand might pull from his deck. And looking deeper, the armed forces really do have to more and more unfold an increasingly developed counter-revolutionary struggle that strengthens their power. That's the way it is. And we think that the movement of the contradiction is in such a direction that we will have to confront each other. The revolutionary forces, the Communist Party of Peru leading the People's War on the one hand, and on the other hand, reaction, the armed forces leading the counter-revolutionary war in Peru. El Diario Chairman, would you accept talks with Alan Garcia Perez? Chairman Gonzalo. The idea of talks is being bandied about, and it is also part of the superpowers game, especially the social imperialists. We see the situation this way. There's a time in the development of a people's war when relations and diplomatic dealings become necessary and do occur. For example, the meeting between Chairman Mao and Chiang Kai-shek. This is something people are familiar with. We also saw it in the case of Vietnam. It is a facet in the development of a revolutionary war, and even more so, of a people's war. But we must start from the understanding that in diplomatic meetings, agreements signed at the table only reflect what has already been established on the battlefield, because no one is going to give up what they have not previously lost. That is understood. Well, one could ask, has that moment arrived in Peru? That moment has not arrived. So why raise the issue of talks? Such talks are simply aimed at halting or undermining the people's war. That's what they are aimed at, and nothing more. So, I repeat, the truth is that the time for meetings and diplomatic dealings has not arrived. It makes no sense. As for the rest, I think it is a demagogic matter that they have been stirring up since the time of Belaunde's government, when due to a proposal from someone from the United Left that was accepted, the then president stated that there was no suitable interlocutor. Words. At bottom, it was nothing but cheap demagoguery without rhyme or reason. And it's still the same today. And who talks about talks? The revisionists, the opportunists, and those who have hope for opera, for this demo-bourgeois order, for this reactionary order, they are the ones. But are they not, at the same time, the ones who are promoting pacification, our destruction? Are they not the ones who make proposals about how to pacify better, which means how to sweep us away, because such are their sinister dreams to satisfy their appetites? They are the same ones. What a coincidence. So then, these talks are a sinister betrayal. Furthermore, one could ask, how can they talk about dialogue, those who even made an amnesty pact with Garcia Perez, which he never honored? So for me, all this jabbering about talks is nothing, I repeat, but looking for a way to undermine the people's war, because it doesn't correspond to reality. When the time comes, the people's war will necessarily have to undertake diplomatic dealings. But our diplomacy will be aimed at seizing power countrywide, fully and completely. We don't want a North Vietnam and a South Vietnam. We don't want a North Korea and a South Korea. We don't want a North Peru and a South Peru. We only want one Peru. This is our condition. Full, complete, and absolute surrender. Are they ready for that? No. What they are plotting is our destruction, and so talks are nothing but a part of that same plan, despite all their demagogic and philistine cackling. 
El Diario. What do you think of the United Left and its political line? What destiny do you foresee for this revisionist front? And what is the PCP's stand on the National People's Assembly? Chairman Gonzalo. Concerning this, I would like to be very brief. First, because what is the line of the United Left at this time, we don't know. In earlier documents, they state that the IU is, quote, a mass front of the socialist trend, end quote, and has focused, as is evident, on parliamentary cretinism. What is at the heart of their positions? A very simple matter. They think they can take over the government, and then, as they say, take over power. Well, they must understand that they cannot take over one without seizing the other. Moreover, first you seize power, and then you set up your government, because the essential problem of state is what system of state, which means, what class does the dictatorship that you exercise correspond to? And from this is derived your system of government. The rest are cheap inventions of putrid revisionists. If you look at their statements, they are not for the destruction of the reactionary state, but for a government that would permit them to continue evolving this outmoded and rotting order. This is what they are after with their proclamations about how, with this government and reforms, they can advance towards socialism. And all this is simply the unrestrained revisionism already criticized by Lenin. On the other hand, we should look at their political theses and their Congress. Regarding their political theses, they are yet to be published. I believe that in the IU, which is a front, let's not forget what we see as a recreation of the old opportunist electoral frontism that we have seen many times in Peru. Such a front is the rejection of a party that leads, and if there is no party of the proletariat to lead, there is no transformation, no revolution. Revolution has never been made through parliament, nor will it ever be. They are giving a facelift to old arguments already discussed in the 1960s. The IU, to be concise, how do I see it? As a jumble of contradictions, of collusion and struggle. What unites them? Collusion, greed, following the road of parliamentary cretinism, reviving old failures, or using them as a card for a reaction to play, to perform a sinister role like Ebert in Germany, that vile and perverse assassin of the revolution in 1919. I believe that is what unites them. And what divides them? Their struggles, their rank and file, their appetites, and the fact that they have different masters. Therefore, they subordinate themselves to how their masters define the situation, because there are revisionists in the IU who serve the Communist Party of the Soviet Union and revisionists who serve Deng, and they are subject to what their masters and their intermediaries of their masters say, not to mention their ties with other centers of power. That's the crux of the problem. These are things that should make those who really want revolution think. These are those who have the duty to think if they are really for revolution. They have to break with this useless, groveling electoral front, which is an obstacle, and, assuming their class position, according to the class that they defend, converge in a really revolutionary front. Let them do so, and come together for real. It is not enough to call others sectarian. You have to show that you are not. And in order to do so, you must first quit being an opportunist, cease being a revisionist, and, for others, they must stop trying to take us down the dead-end road of Christian socialism. If they want revolution, let them prove it, and express it in deeds by abandoning the erroneous road they are following. Let them stop being the tales of Soviet and Chinese revisionism. That is the first thing they would have to do, aside from, I repeat, not coming to us with positions based on the road of Christian socialism. They should really come to understand Marxism, Leninism, Maoism, principally Maoism. So long as they do not understand it, they will not advance. Let them understand what it means to make revolution through people's war. And let them understand and open their eyes, because the truth is irrefutable. They cannot deny what all the world, except them, sees. They must stop being so power-hungry and must explicitly accept their class limitations, and accept that it is the proletariat as a class that leads through a communist party 
and this is what mainly interests us. Regarding the National People's Assembly, the ANP is a particular thing. On the one hand, they say it, quote, is the germ of power, end quote. Very well, germ of power. I ask, are they trying to form Soviets? Are they recreating the Bolivian experience at the time of Juan José Torres? Can power be created this way? To raise this supposed germ of power is simply and plainly to oppose the new power that we are actually forging in the real world. On the other hand, they also say that the ANP is a mass front. So, is it a competitor of the IU, which is also a mass front? Okay, let them define what it is then. Is it a germ of power, or is it a mass front? What is it really? Let them clearly state how power can be forged. What do we see here? Simply that the ANP is run by revisionism. There's lots of evidence. Their strikes follow the same mold, and even the dates are the same as those established by the revisionists through the CGTP. Therefore, revisionism is the leader here, and revolutionaries cannot follow revisionists. And those who really want revolution, I repeat, let them demonstrate it in their actions, and let them understand, first and foremost, the authentic revolutionary process of people's war that is taking place here in this country. Because as long as they don't understand it, they will not be able to play the role that many of these people could really well play. People who simply have good intentions, but totally lack clarity, even though they believe the opposite is true. El Diario Chairman, how do you see the situation in regard to the class struggle of the masses? What do you think of the existing organizations? Chairman Gonzalo as to how we see the class struggle of the masses, I'd like to start from this basic point. Our people are heroic. Our class, the proletariat, even more so. Since the people and the proletariat in general are persistent protagonists of the class struggle, they have never let up, nor will they ever let up until we reach communism. I think the first thing that we must do is recognize the greatness of our people, of our proletariat. And secondly, we must recognize and be grateful for, see clearly and say firmly, that without their support, without their sustenance, we would have done nothing. Absolutely nothing. Because the masses are the ones who make history, and we believe this fervently. Just as we believe that, quote, it's right to rebel, end quote. This is another key principle of the masses. How do we see the masses? With the deep rejoicing of a communist. My greetings to this growing flood of arising masses who are beginning to recapture past glories and write new pages in history. The masses have begun to participate in, and will continue participating in, an intense process of class struggle, and the pessimism that reigns in the IU, as Mr. Moreno, who leads the Patria Roja, himself recognizes, will not take hold among the masses, because the masses are not pessimists. Let's remember that Chairman Mao said, only the revisionists and opportunists are pessimists. The proletariat and the communists are always optimists, because the future is ours. It is historically determined so long as we keep to our course. The masses will not fall into pessimism, nor have they ever done so. That is absurd. It is a slander. The masses fight, but in order to fight, they need leadership, a party, because there is no mass movement that can unfold and sustain itself much less develop itself, without a party to lead it. We are filled with revolutionary joy when we see how these masses are fighting, and, as their own actions show, learning from those masses already involved in the People's War. And how the masses begin to put into practice the great slogan, Combat and Resist. This is not a time to just receive. We must be gracious and give in return, and do so doubly, so as to be doubly gracious. And I think that the masses are doing that, giving really outstanding examples that make us see the brilliant future, the future the masses themselves will see. Because they are the ones who will make revolution. The party only leads them. I think this is a principle that we all know, but it's useful to repeat it. In regard to your question about the organizations, 
We believe that today, more than ever, we have to seriously study what Lenin taught us in his work, The Collapse of the Second International, Chapter 8. He says that the state of exploiters, the bourgeois state, the reactionary state, allows the existence of organizations that sustain and serve it so that it can maintain itself and survive. And what do these organizations do in order to maintain themselves? They sell out the revolution for a mess of potage. I believe this saying fits them like a glove. But Lenin tells us more, that the revolution can expect nothing from these organizations. The revolution has to create its own organizations in times of war and revolution, like the ones we are living in now, and will live in from now on. And in the future, the revolution will triumph. So Lenin tells us that we have to create new organizations that serve the revolution, even though we have to go over the heads of those who sell out the workers, of the traitors to the revolution. I believe that those are Lenin's words. They deserve immense respect from us, and should move us to profound and serious reflection. Otherwise, we would not be serving our class, or the people. And we have to emphasize the urgent necessity to help everyone acquire more and more class consciousness, so that they live as what they are, as the working class or as the people with interests that are opposed to and antagonistic to the exploiters. And they should feel clearly the power that they have when their strikes stop production. And let them understand and feel and carry forward a strike as a school of warfare, as a school of communism, and continue unfolding their strikes as the main form of struggle in the economic sphere, because that is what they are. But under the present circumstances, these struggles must be inseparably linked to the conquest of power. So let's unite the struggle for economic demands with the struggle for the seizure of power, with the people's war. Because it is in the defense of their class interests, of the interests of the proletariat, of the people. That is what we need, and that is what we believe the masses are pushing for evermore. In our party, we came to the conclusion a long time ago on what we call the law of masses, the law of the incorporation of the masses into the war and into the revolution, like the one we are unfolding. And this applies here. The masses are joining the struggle in surges, bigger and bigger surges. This is the course that we are following, and we will unite 90% of the Peruvian people. What for? So that the masses bring about the victory of the revolution and the culmination of the work that they initiated eight years ago and have been carrying forward with their own blood. Because the revolution is theirs, it has arisen from them. From their depths. They, the masses, make history, I repeat, the party only leads them. I believe this is true. El Diario Chairman, in what political and social sectors does the PCP seek its allies? Do you have any affinity with political groups in the country? The opportunists claim that you are sectarian. How do you determine your united front policy? What is the strength of the party in the countryside and the workers' movement among the people as a whole? Chairman Gonzalo If you will allow me, I will start from how we see the front. We have already explained how we are carrying it forward, but what we need to state clearly here is how we conceive of the united front which Chairman Mao spoke of. While I'm on the subject, let me say that it was Mao who established the laws of the front, the six laws of the front. There were no such laws before him. In accordance with these criteria of Marxism-Leninism-Maoism, our goal is a front of classes, with the proletariat as the leading class, the peasantry as the main force, the petty bourgeoisie as an ally which we must pay attention to, and in particular the intellectuals, because they are necessary to the revolution, as Chairman Mao also taught us. And in this front, Under certain circumstances and conditions, even the national bourgeoisie can and does participate. This is what we understand by the United Front. This front has a foundation, which is the Worker-Peasant Alliance, forged in the countryside. We are forging it today, and have been for eight years with arms in hand. Why is the Worker-Peasant Alliance necessary? Because without it, the proletariat would not have hegemony, and this front requires a Communist Party to lead it. This is our position. 
We are absolutely opposed to the revisionist theory being applied in Central America, and that everyone wants to spread elsewhere, that, quote, everyone is revolutionary, end quote, quote, everyone is Marxist, end quote, quote, there is no need for the leadership of a communist party, end quote, quote, it is enough to simply unite everyone and base oneself on a front in order to lead a revolution, end quote. That is the rejection of Marxism. It is the rejection of Marx, of Lenin, and of Chairman Mao. No Marxist has disregarded the need for the leadership of a party. Without it, how can the hegemony of the proletariat be concretized? Only through a really genuine communist party, that is, a Marxist-Leninist-Maoist party that firmly and consistently serves the interests of the class and defends the interests of the people. This is how we see it, and this is what we are forging and developing. For us, the issue of the front has to do with the aforementioned thesis, that the party is the selection of the best elements, and is the necessary leadership, but it does not make the revolution, because it is the masses who make it. Therefore, there is the need for a front to bring together 90% of the population, the immense majority. This is what we are seeking, what we are pursuing, and what we are doing. As far as groups we've had, at different times, links with organizations. And when we've had them, we've treated those organizations as they should be treated, as equals, and we've exchanged experiences. In some cases, they have asked that the party help them politically, and we have done so. There are various cases like that, but it is better not to mention names now. About whether we are sectarian, please let me read what is in the document Develop People's War to Serve the World Revolution. These are the words of our founder, and we use precisely these words, because those who claim to be Mariatagis must truly be just that. But you cannot be a follower of Mariatagi without being a Marxist-Leninist-Maoist. Mariatagi said, quote, We are living in a period of total ideological war. Those who represent force for renewal cannot, either by accident or chance, unite or merge themselves with those who represent conservatism or regression. There is a historical abyss between them. They speak different languages and have a different understanding of history. I think we should unite the like-minded, and not those who differ. We should bring together those whom history wants together. There should be solidarity between those of whom history requires solidarity. This, it seems to me, is the only possible alliance. A common understanding with a precise and effective sense of history. I am a revolutionary, but I believe that men who think clearly and definitively will be able to understand and appreciate each other, even while struggling against each other. The political force with whom I will never reach an understanding is the other camp, mediocre reformism, domesticated reformism, hypocritical democracy, end quote. We adhere to this. We are not sectarian, nor are there any actions on our part that indicate that. What no one can demand of us is that we march into the swamp. Lenin taught us, if someone decides they want to head into the swamp, they have the right to do so but not to call upon us to go into the muck with them. Lenin said we must follow our steep and difficult road all the way to the summit, or, in other words, we must face the enemy's fire, but we will continue to advance. We are not, then, sectarians or dogmatists. We are simply communists, and we adhere to those wise words of Mariatagi. And, what's more, we demand that those who claim to follow Mariatagi really follow him, and that they prove it. As to the strength of the party in the countryside, what I can say concretely is that the majority of our members are peasants, the vast majority. And a limitation that we have is the insufficient number of workers. This is a serious limitation, but we are making, and will continue to make, more efforts to correct it, because we need proletarian communists. The workers offer tempering, their steel-like quality, because this characterizes them as a class. Moreover, we know how our strength and influence is growing among the people as a whole. We can say that the people's guerrilla army is made up of masses, of peasants, of workers, intellectuals, people from the petty bourgeoisie. We are talking about thousands of people. We have hundreds of people's committees organized in base areas. And we exercise power over tens of thousands of people. 
This is our reality. The influence of the party is growing. We are gaining more and more influence among the masses. We are applying what Marxism espouses, teaching the proletariat, the people, the masses, by means of powerful actions that drive home the point. We believe that our growth among the masses has begun to make a big leap. This is what we can say to you. We want, and it is our task and part of our plan, to make a big leap in our work among the masses. The masses in this country need the leadership of the Communist Party. We hope that with more revolutionary theory and practice, with more armed actions, with more people's war, with more power, we can reach the very heart of our class and the people and really win them over. What for? To serve them. That is what we want. El Diario Chairman, other organizations either don't define or talk vaguely about socialist revolution in Peru. Why does the PCP say that the Peruvian revolution has stages? What is the democratic revolution? And what will the proletarian cultural revolutions that the PCP will lead after the defeat of the counter-revolutionary forces be like? Will they be like the ones Chairman Mao led in China? Chairman Gonzalo Defining the character of a revolution is a key question. For us, in keeping with what was established in our own party congress, the revolution is a democratic one. Adhering to Maoism, we have been able to develop a more complete understanding of the situation in our country. We think that Peru is a semi-feudal and semi-colonial society in which bureaucrat capitalism has developed. Therefore, the revolution is a democratic one. We think that the democratic revolution must confront three mountains. Imperialism, mainly Yankee imperialism, bureaucrat capitalism, and semi-feudalism. This democratic revolution demands that we undertake a people's war. That is why we have insisted on this course. This people's war is what will allow us to destroy these three mountains and seize countrywide power, in our opinion, in the not-too-distant future. That depends, in the end, on the increased effort that all of us who fight in the people's war exert, and on the masses rallying more and more to the people's war. This democratic revolution must be followed immediately by a socialist revolution. I want to spell this out. Basing ourselves on what Chairman Mao taught us with great farsightedness, thinking of the situations that might arise, he tells us that the democratic revolution ends the very day that power is seized countrywide and the People's Republic is founded. That very day and hour, the Socialist Revolution begins. And in the Socialist Revolution, we have to unfold a proletarian dictatorship and thus carry forward fundamental transformations in order to develop socialism. We think that there is a third kind of revolution. By studying Chairman Mao Zedong and the resolutions of the CPC, we are increasingly understanding the importance of the great proletarian cultural revolution as the continuation of the revolution under the dictatorship of the proletariat. It is indispensable. Without it, the revolution cannot continue its march towards communism. We believe there will be successive cultural revolutions, but we think that those cultural revolutions will have to be forged in practice. While we should base ourselves on the chairman's thesis and the monumental experience of the CPC, we have to apply them to our own reality. In this way, we are also anti-dogmatic. We cannot be mechanical. That would be going against Maoism. We think that as a communist party, we have one goal, communism. But to get there, excuse me for reiterating, either all of us on earth will get to communism or none of us will get there. We are totally opposed to Khrushchev's revisionist thesis, in which he talked about communism in the USSR by the year 1980. Chairman Mao reaffirmed once again that either everyone or no one will enter the stage of communism. That is why our revolution is unbreakably linked to the world revolution. That is our final and definitive goal. Everything is stages, steps, moments. We believe that the prospect for arriving at communism is a long way off. We believe that Chairman Mao Zedong's outlook on this is correct. El Diario
They say that when the PCP seizes power in this country, it will confiscate all kinds of property. Is this true? How will it deal with the foreign debt? Chairman Gonzalo We've already seen that the party program clarifies these matters. A democratic revolution, like the one we are carrying forward, has its targets, the three mountains we've already talked about. That is to say, we are for breaking with imperialist, principally Yankee, domination. But at the same time, we struggle to prevent social imperialism, or any other imperialist power, from ever exercising domination over us. We are for the destruction of semi-feudalism, implementing the great slogan that is still valid, land to the tiller. It is good to emphasize this, because many things are said about it. Chairman Mao stressed this slogan again and again, which for us means the destruction of semi-feudal property and the distribution of the land as property to the peasantry, mainly the poor peasantry. And we are for the confiscation of bureaucrat capital. And I repeat again, this is very important, because it gives the new power an economic foundation from which to direct the economy and lead the way toward socialism. We are against those three mountains. As for the national or middle bourgeoisie, the policy is to respect their rights, and we adhere to this. Further than that, we cannot go without changing the character of the revolution. The idea of confiscating all property is nothing but one of the tales, one of the lies, that they have always spread against communists, as Marx so masterfully explained. To oppose communism, reaction and the enemies of the revolution have always concocted falsehoods and lies. Since the great founder of Marxism endured all these slanders, lies, and distortions of his sagacious teachings, we believe that what is being said against our party is nothing but a continuation of that old reactionary school and of the enemies of the revolution. El Diario What will the party do about the foreign debt? Chairman Gonzalo Since it is imperialist property, it will be confiscated. And I think we can add that it is the only way to really get rid of this immense weight which is oppressing so many countries and impoverishing nations and peoples. Only through revolution can this be done. There is no other way. All the other means and approaches that they raise are only aimed at getting imperialism off the hook. Furthermore, we believe historical experience bears this out. El Diario and the Communist Party, how is it solving the land problem, and what problems are APRA and PUM implementing? Chairman Gonzalo The land problem is fundamental, because this problem is really the one that is resolved through the democratic revolution, apart from the other questions we've already discussed. What we carry out is the destruction of semi-feudal relations of production, and the distribution of the land to the peasantry principally the poor peasants, then the middle peasants. On the condition that there is some land left, or, if it is judged to be correct, land can be given to the rich peasants, and likewise, if it is correct or necessary, we can take land from them if there is not enough land to go around. Even the landlords, as the chairman taught, if they want to work, can earn their bread by the sweat of their brow, as the saying goes, and learn what it is to till the land and not live from simply collecting rent. This is the policy we follow. The policy of the party on this question has been developing. One of the important things that we have done has been to promote a movement of land invasions. A very important one was in the Department of La Libertad, where more than 300,000 hectares were distributed and 160,000 peasants mobilized. Looking at all the mobilizations that we have had, this one succeeded in mobilizing the most masses. This movement was promoted in order to undermine Apura's plans, and we also carried it out in Puno. We were the ones who started the land invasions in Puno, while Pum was arguing with Apura about what to do and how to do it. This is the plain and simple truth. Later, the government was obliged to issue decrees for Puno in particular, decrees that they have not enforced. In this case, as in others in the Andean region, APRA has aimed to carry out the redistribution that Morales Bermúdez proposed when he was president. The dispute with PUM 
has been over how to do it, whether the government should do it alone, or if other organizations should take part. What have the government in Boom sought to do? To keep the river from overflowing its banks. This is what they've tried to do, and once more, we see them doing what they did in 1974, when they were the revolutionary vanguard with the land seizures in Apurimac, where thousands of peasants were mobilized. And for what? To negotiate based on Law 17716, a corporative law of Velasco's fascism. The famous acts of Tohama and Huancahuacho stand as proof of this. Someone should answer for this, and it would be good to refresh their memories. Did they help the regime or not? They helped it, because their analysis then was that Law 17716 was a good one, and that its only shortcoming was that it was not a socialist law. This is political stupidity, because the land problem is an elementary democratic demand. And if it were not, Marxism would have to be modified on this question. This is what they are resuscitating today in collusion with opera. Well, there are some things that get said a lot. But it would be good if, being what they are, they would put their hands on their chests and make an act of contrition and come clean as to whether they have served the enemy, even serving as informants with the result that our forces were attacked. It would be good if they thought about this. It has been proven, and we've known since the 60s, and also through a new study that was carried out in the 70s, that the simple act of getting land, if it is not linked to a people's war, to the struggle to seize power, simply produces an incorporation into the system, and becomes a prop of the system, and the same stagnant semi-feudal process continues. There's proof everywhere. Pomacocha and Cacamarca, and the Department of Ayacucho, for example. I think that those are things that we have to think about. The experiences in Apurimac in 1974... Vanguardia's land seizures, what ends do they serve? The setting up of a corporative system, the development of the associative forms. Was this or was it not what Belasco wanted? Consequently, this represented consolidation into the system, the evolution of feudalism, when the point is to demolish it, to destroy it. This is what Boom still does not understand today. Nor will they understand it. It requires analyzing things from another ideological viewpoint, from Marxism, in order to understand how to take and how to defend the land with guns in hand. That's the point. Furthermore, Opera has other plans. We must pay a lot of attention, especially to the plans they have for the uncultivated land of the coast, with their recent decrees and development plans for those who have the ability to invest for the purpose of generating export products. And this is leading to a sham distribution and a scramble for land in La Malleque, La Libertad, Ica, and the Peruvian coastal region as a whole. With their recent decrees, it is lawful to allot up to 450 hectares to one person. Will the poor be the ones who acquire these lands? With what money will they be able to dig wells, for example, in order to have access to water? Impossible. These are greedy plans whose results are already clear, a sham distribution. Why else are they in La Libertad? For whose benefit, if not for Aparas, and for its leaders and associates, outstanding among whom is Minister Remigio Morales Bermudez, a partner in several big monopolist enterprises, who plays an important economic role? This does not benefit the peasantry, and on the coast, there are also peasants who need land, and the land should be for them. And that's why we saw an uproar not so long ago in La Libertad, condemning the plans to irrigate the land. Other problems. The distribution of land in the jungle, 30,000 hectares. Who will be able to administer this land? Dionisio Romero or someone similar. A poor peasant will not be able to oversee it, much less receive it. But the land is for those who work it, mainly for the poor peasantry. On the other hand, Apara has been handed a resounding defeat in their counter-revolutionary plans in the so-called Trapecio Andino, Andean zone, including the departments of Ayacucho, Huancabelica, Apurimac, and parts of Cusco, Puno, and Arequipa. And we openly say to them, as others have even said to them, 
that we made them see that the Andean region exists in Peru. It is because of this that Garcia Perez has rediscovered his trapecio andino in order to make his own showcase. But his perverse plans have failed. They have fallen apart or paralyzed. If that's not true, what happened to the Cachi plan in Ayacucho? This plan was inaugurated by the man who calls himself president, who flew there in a helicopter, and with lots of fanfare, explained from the Punas, high-altitude planes, what he neither knows nor understands. Or the plans for Rasuilka? We destroyed it, because it was a counterinsurgency plan, and because we insist that the lands be given to the peasants who need them, mainly the poor peasants. I also believe that mention should be made of a few other things, the rondas, the peasant patrols. What have they done with these organizations the masses created to defend themselves? These organizations are now under the control of the state, the armed forces, and the police. This is clear and concrete. And it is they, the IU, who proudly approved that famous law, and today are throwing a fit over the regulations in this very law. But the regulations are derived from the law, so if you approve the law, you have to put up with the regulations. Basically, what they have done is simply facilitate what the army and the armed forces were demanding, a law to sanction the mitnadas, or defense committees, set up by them. They said that there was no legal protection for what they were doing. Well, such a law did exist. It was called the Law of the Peasant Night Patrols. Do the police use them or not? Does the army use them or not? Do the gamonales use them or not? This is the reality. They owe us an explanation for this. That much they owe us, not to mention their statutes. What are they like? Are they really Marxists? Were they drawn up based on the standpoint of our class, of the people? Don't they involve the outmoded ideology of the Incas? Don't they express a stand of Christian personalism? Don't they work in close connection with the church? If not, why does the church publish their documents? And when I talk about the church, I mean the ecclesiastical hierarchy. It would be good, when you have time, and you need a little diversion, to read over these regulations. They are extremely revealing. We also denounce Abra's plans in the Alto Wallaga, where, under the pretext of fighting drug trafficking, they permit the use of the deadly pesticide spike, which the Yankee monopolies themselves say is like a series of small atomic bombs. El Diario Chairman, what will be the main characteristics of the new Democratic People's Republic that you and your party propose? Chairman Gonzalo Its characteristics are essentially those of a joint dictatorship. I insist on this, because in Peru, we must think seriously about the problem of the state and analyze it from the standpoint of Marxism-Leninism-Maoism. And the first thing that the problem of the state raises to us is the question of the state system, or the kind of class dictatorship that is exercised. In our case, it is a joint dictatorship. Presently, it is a dictatorship of only three classes, the proletariat, the peasantry, and the progressives, the petty bourgeoisie. The national bourgeoisie is not taking part, but we respect their rights, this we do. The government system derived from the above is a system based on people's assemblies. How do we carry this out in practice? As committees. And these people's committees group together form base areas, and the sum of the base areas constitutes the new democratic people's republic. This is what we are unfolding, and will be unfolding, until the end of the democratic revolution. What I would like to stress is that the party has decided to sow the seeds of power, so that the people begin to exercise it and learn to run the state. Because, once they learn to run the state, they learn that this state can only be maintained by force of arms. As it is conquered, so must it be defended. Sowing the seeds of power requires that we sow in people's minds the need for the new power, and that people see it in practice. This is what we are doing. The people perform the overall functions of leadership, construction, and planning as part of the new Democratic People's Republic. I think that's enough on this subject, because other things have already been explained in the party's documents.